Meow. Hoople's cat, the armchair prepper is returned and the book I've decided to actually kick off the new series with, Armchair Prepper Reads, is one you may have heard about. It's been getting a lot of buzz and I've read it, read it quite quickly, I'll show you why. So stay tuned and we're going to look at the highlights and lowlights of this book. Silco has been known for a while um, online in prepper areas. He did a year in, I believe, Sarajevo in the 1990s during the Yugoslavian Civil War. That was kind of a religious war and he suffered being besieged in a city without much external supply for a year. Now, that being said, that's not actually true. People were able to get out of the city, though it wasn't easy. and food was dropped by the United Nations intermittently about every couple of days so it wasn't a total siege a total siege would have probably seen most of them die a lot of them did die and if I get around to it I'm going to do a background on uh, Sarajevo and the Yugoslavian Civil War I think it's kind of an interesting one but however he's had blog posts and his own website and stuff like that so finally somebody decided to try to monetize him and what they've done is they produced this book now it looks a fairly hefty book, it's kind of interesting. The Dark Secrets of SHTF Survival. There's very few dark secrets in here. Uh, there's very few specifics on how to survive in here. And it does warn of graphic content. Well, I didn't find it that graphic, but I guess some people might. It promises to give the brutal truth about violence, death and mayhem that you know must know to survive. And it doesn't but it does so stay tuned first off the book itself uh, it's fairly pricey but not outrageously pricey for a small volume it is fairly big and Selco knows his prepping audience he uses very very big type font for those people that can't read and it uses very very basic English however probably won't be able to see this too well but, what did I find of interest in here as I was browsing it? I marked in a purple highlighter. Pretty much every page. So I'm not going to go through every page because I think it's kind of pointless. What he basically says is that people have two reactions to a sudden SHTF. They become angels and die, or they become animals and die. What a prepper would do is be an animal when they need to be, but be an angel when they should be. So in other words, walking a thin line. His other messages from the book is that lone wolf is not a great idea, that you do need a small compact group, that SHTFs do take people by surprise, and reaction to it is important, and that most modern preppers, specifically in North America, actually aren't reacting to SHTF in anything other than Hollywood fantasy mode. And having lived through a severe SHTF, knowing the rest of the world was just fine, and I think that's a critical part not mentioned in the book, is the fact that if SHTF is global, if what he's going through here is global, there's no MREs being dropped, right? There's no evacuations early on for people who are ill and you know the rest of the world is in the same mesh you're in. I think that would fundamentally change response and what's going on. He opens by talking a lot about media and, and very much the Yugoslavian Civil War was a media driven event. Um, when Tito died, the communist dictator of Yugoslavia and war hero, he actually, his loss was enabling various parts of Yugoslavia to actually split off from each other and to split off from each other politically. The politicians decided to hate other regional ethnicities in Yugoslavia and use the media for that. So I think this is kind of an important piece. Just before S hit the fan, the buildup of hate was so dense that you could feel it in the air. After that we were fed through the media that there were great differences between us and the differences were actually so big they might be a problem for our future life in the region. In reality you can point out huge differences between any group of people or political opinions anywhere in the world. And still, that does not mean it needs to end up in blood. 
but we were led to believe that blood was the only option for solving our problems. Now that might sound familiar to people who live in the United Kingdom, who live in France, who live in Canada to some degree, and who live in America. Media feeds violence, it feeds otherness, it feeds the fact that if you are a black man in Canada, you are being perceived differently from a white man in Canada. And if you're First Nations in Canada, you currently have been experiencing genocide for the last 300 years and nobody's doing anything about it. We can hate easily as human beings if we feel threatened. So the media makes us fear, makes us feel threatened, and then says, hey, look at them over there. It's all their fault. All we have to do is get rid of them, drive them out, right? And then driving out becomes killing them all. Now most of my subs, most of you, are sane. Some people aren't sane. A lot of people on a lot of prepper sites are insane. And they need to hear this, but they won't be able to. Whenever you find yourself in a situation when you feel that you generally hate groups of people, options or states, stop for a moment and go through serious mental check. Are you being manipulated by someone and what are the reasons for it? I witnessed many times innocent people being killed because it was a public opinion was formed that it's okay and it was scary how fast that opinion was formed. Yeah. Do you dislike transgendered people? Do you like doctors and nurses who give vaccines or do you hate them like what's going on what are you what are your source of information and we talked about echo chambers before and echo chambers are dangerous for that specific reason it cuts you off from sources of interest and information that could potentially help you for example as a social democrat liberal vegan climate change prepper a lot of people automatically do not watch me as a prepper that states that guns are a tool and they have no place on my channel because if you can't figure out how to use a tool it's as simple to use as a gun when and where and how you're an idiot and if you need to watch a video on it you're a really big idiot and if you want to watch people shoot guns online why would you watch a gun video people shooting guns at targets for five ten minutes when you wouldn't watch somebody gardening for 10 minutes and actually telling you how to grow food in SHTF. His language is fairly colourful and I love this one. He talks about an old Yugoslavian freedom fighter who was actually interviewed by a parade for him and all the rest of it from the local dignitaries of his area and they all said now we're going to have a few words from the hero. Uh, useless Yugoslavian accent there. And the old hero said, well son, it was a complete and utter shitstorm. And then they bustled him off stage. All war is a complete and utter shitstorm. I mean, you can say what you like about Selko. He spent a long time waiting to try and cash in on his advice. And I'm glad he has, finally. He has experienced killing people and people trying to kill him in a SHTF situation. I can tell you that for definite, having read this book. Now, he does repeat the same message over and over which is that if you decide you are definitely going to bug out, you're probably going to die. If you decide to definitely stay in place, you're definitely going to die. If you decide to defend your home and defend your family and defend your pantry, you're definitely going to die. He also points out later on in the book that when they use human shields, which was common to approach buildings they wanted to attack, that by not shooting the hostages to kill the attackers, you're going to die. The decisions have to be made and a lot of them are horrific. But you can't do anything other than protect your own life and your families. Now this also means you may have to run away with just the clothes you're wearing. So if you try and have lots of prepper stocks and stuff like that, that's a great idea. But as soon as anybody knows about it or even suspects it or starts to go home to home, your mythology of you and your gun and your couple of fat buddies defending that homestead is that utter garbage. 50 to 200 to 300 people would coalesce in gangs in Sarajevo and act as enforcers. They would take what they wanted. And you have two choices. You avoid them or you give them what you want. It's that simple. There ain't no fighting a superior force. When I read the words, I'll do that when SHTF, I feel bad. Because in essence, you do not know what you'll be forced to do. 
but you will have to do it when the day comes because on that day you adapt and overcome not by sticking hard to your imagined I'll only do that now I still think scenarios are good well like Corsair Trainer has his EMP what you do in the beginning of an EMP and going through the EMP scenario the good idea to put yourself in that mindset and this book puts you in the mindset of somebody unprepared in Sarajevo this section on surprises didn't surprise me but I got some background in this so the surprises for him were how close the fighting will be. So he shows this picture and he says that literally each house facing each other would have enemies in it fighting. And oftentimes the actual battle in that city was closer than that. Uh, you'll simply never be sure how safe and secure are your surroundings. 24-7, 7 days a week, 365, the risk of sudden death is there all the time. That will affect everything. The enemy will look, sound and speak like you. Red Dawn is utter garbage. Nobody's going to invade America because simply put you have nuclear weapons and you'll use them. Even if it destroys everybody. But in a course of civil disturbance or non-civil disturbance, in a total system collapse, your good friend, your good neighbour might well become an animal and kill you and rape your wife and rape your children, male and female, just because they can get away with it because they have the power to do so. You cannot prejudge how people will react in SHTF and some people will be utterly horrific. So a lot of preppers online talk about how to keep their kids entertained in SHTF because they might get bored, right? And as soon as people start talking like that, I go, oh no. This is not an ice storm. If you're prepping for the end of collapse of society, he says the surprise for him was how busy every average day was. Collecting water, wood, trying to get food, scavenging, like, all the time. Because you can't just not do that. You can't just say, well, you know what, I'm tired today, I'm having a break. Even if you've broken your leg, even if you've got dysentery, you have to try and get some food. In SHCF, you are the first unit, rear and backup. If you fuck up and break your leg, there is no medical evacuation. If you did not find food or any other resources, there is no service that will do that for you. It's a hard time and it is full of acquiring things and finishing jobs. You are everything when SHTF because the system is gone. Now I do think a lot of people don't grasp that concept. I think intellectually they might be getting close to it, but I don't think they grasp it. Number four. The level of the threat. In SHTF almost everything is a threat to you. Snipers, angry neighbours, motor shells, gangs, uh, gangs of liberals, all of that sort of stuff. Women! Some people are frightened of women. Um, well, what really is the threat is the lack of food, complete lack of hygiene, level of contamination, risk of illness and injury, being found, being informed on, being tricked, getting captured, and many, many more make up a large amount of threats that most never think about. So he says, imagine every supply that you use is gone and isn't coming back. That's the world of SHTF with societal collapse. Now he says, with good preparation and good correct mentality, you can minimise the shock and make the transition shorter. So the reality of defending your assets, this is an asset, right? So you have your prepped home, it's concrete, you have your fire stuff, you're all ready to rock and roll and a couple of mortar shells or a rocky propelled grenade goes into your house. There you go, preps are gone. So this is one of the reasons I preach cacheting a lot. I do think if you have certain supplies you need to cache them and I do think that's really really important uh, because you cannot guarantee any position, any fixed position as safe. And he mentions that quite a bit. He says that you have to be able to move. You have to be able to move immediately without trying to stay to where you're normalized, where you've got your gear, where your family is, where your ill brother is. You may just have to get up and go. If you don't get up and go, you'll die as well. well anybody that follows my channel will not be surprised that I completely agree with what he's about to say. In the end, it all comes to the matter of power and possession. You are just a small piece of everything. You're only a small part of the tool. And I fully agree with that. Network have a local community, have it functional, prep for it. Prep for your community, prep for the people in your community you like. Make sure that you have a group, make sure the group is functional. 
Don't be loyal to the group. If the group's about to be wiped out, run. Okay? This Alamo stuff, fighting the homestead, common in prep fiction, in reality you all die. One second after, which I'm going to take to pieces at some point, is classic for that. You have a well-organized, well-trained, motorized, cannibal, which is ludicrous, army attacking an untrained, small town, and they stand and fight and win. No, they'd stand and fight and die. His main lesson of an unbeing adaptation is what over the years I've learned that it is more important to have one more month of food stored or one more skill learned than to waste time on worrying who is going to be elected. Politics has no place in prepping. Politics has no place in SHTF. It's you and me trying to live, trying to survive. Nobody gives a damn who the president was if society has fallen. And if you do care about that and you spend most of your online time thinking about why President Trump has been treated badly or why President Trump exists, either or, you're kind of wasting your prepping time. What you should be doing is figuring out how you are going to filter water that has feces in it, dead human beings in it, whilst under sniper fire in your small town if you can't get out. So Sil Cole's been running some courses for a few years and uh, if you've got the money and interest, I would probably do one. I've been through most of what he's talking about in my life anyway, so I don't really need to suffer to figure out that it's going to be horrible. I cannot get rid of the feeling that a majority of people see SHGF as big fun, shooting while drinking beer, with additional testing of all their cool gear. I see that in blogs, comments, forums, documentaries, movies. Harsh words from Selko. He's absolutely right. A lot of people are deluded out there. I had more than one participant of my course who told me, this is not fun, it's hard and it's not pleasant. Indeed, it is not a camping trip, it is not a cross-country drive with the kids and the dog. A lot of people are still clinging to that online. A lot of huge preppers are telling you, if only you buy X or Y, you have the advantage and you will live and you will be fine. No, you won't. Like me, he thinks precious metals have a minor place. He also says to be very careful. What he recommends is hoarding old gold wedding rings and jewellery and stuff like that. So when you need to bribe somebody with gold or silver, you reluctantly pull it off your hand or take it off your wife's hand and hand it over. If you pull out a shiny new gold coin at a checkpoint, they're going to think, ooh, I wonder if you have any more of them. And the six armed guys who've got the drop on you at the checkpoint are going to search you and take them. People don't understand the reality of gang warfare and societal fall. The survival movement is big business and it has become more, much more, about selling items to make you believe that you are prepared than about learning and gaining knowledge. I think we all agree with that and I think we all know that. But I'd ask you today why you still subscribe to big channels that are nothing more than fantasy mixed with selling you crappy junk. Do you need to buy a $400 gas can? Working with other folks, you need to work with other folks to have friends, group, connections before SHTF. Survival alone is a real tough mother. When SHTF, you will have yourself and people who want to harm you. That is it. So he's talking urban, he's talking siege, he's talking that, right? You cannot collect rainwater for weeks because there's been no rain. You cannot hang taps inside of old buildings because there's enemies all around looking for signs of life to kill you. Bartering, it will be done and you have to be careful and there's rumours of it and it's essential in a siege mentality. But you get played by people who sell you cigarettes but the cartons are mostly empty or filled with something else or just the ends of cigarettes with foam in them. I would do that in a trade situation I thought I could get away with it. Or even worse, the guy you're trading with shoots you in the back. People are the biggest threat. Message from Selko's book is you will not know in SHTF who is a threat and who is an enemy and who is a helper and who is a friend. And day by day, minute by minute, the enemies become friends and friends become enemies and vice versa. It's going to be extremely fluid. You've got to be very, very careful all the time and you've got to be really in tune with your environment all the time. I like what he has to say about skills. He says you really need as many skills as you can get. 
and he actually is a nurse, uh, which kind of amused me because I'm a nurse as well. But he uses nursing skills to actually trade nursing skills for food and ammo and water early on and during the entire SHCF because it was a skill that was in demand. But one of the things he says is whatever your skill base is, do remember in SHCF you'll have to shorten your practices, you'll have to shorten those skills. You'll be under stress, things will be missing, you need to be able to adapt. So that's one of the things I've often talked about, you know, do you want a, a, a veterinary surgeon in your bug out group or a brain surgeon? Unless that brain surgeon is an avid outdoors person, I would go with vet. All round skills are going to way better for you than somebody who's very focused. For example, I've got a nurse in my group, that's great. Well, in my group, I've got me, I had like 25 years of trauma ICU background and some military stuff, and Kitty has got 30 years of trauma ICU, very adaptable, used to high end stuff, no problems at all. But if your nurse works in long-term care or if your nurse works on a medical floor, yeah, they can check your blood sugar. And for that reason alone, this book is worth getting. It is a blast of reality. This will be the end of part one.